Okay, so now we're here for part two of Construct Validity Lecture. And we wrapped up by talking about validity, that is the test measures, what it's supposed to measure. Now we're talking about reliability. And reliability is the test's ability to measure the same thing twice. And uh, the most common example of this is if I'm uh, weighing myself with a scale, uh, I'm measuring my weight. So the scale, if it's reliable, should be able to measure uh, my weight uh, you know, twice in a row and give me the same number. And so if I jump on a scale and it says I weigh 200 pounds, and I have an ego, so that's really not true, uh, and then I jump off it again then jump on the scale again, and it says I weigh 100 pounds, then we're going to say that scale's broken. And indeed it's right. That's right. That scale is unreliable because it can't measure my weight and give me the same number twice in a row, it's unreliable. If we had a reliable scale, it would tell me the same weight or pretty much the same weight down to like maybe a tenth of a pound uh, every time I weigh myself like that. So reliability uh, of responses to a survey is also important to determine uh, because unreliable surveys will increase the amount of error in test scores. And we're going to talk about that uh, at the end of the lecture. But we want to keep the amount of error in the scores down so we keep the error in the whole experiment down. And I'll explain why error, uh, why later. But the important thing is we want to keep error low all around the experiment. Uh, if participants respond to the questions on a questionnaire in different ways at different times, or they respond in different ways to different sets of questions, similar questions in the survey, the researcher will not be able to draw accurate conclusions from the survey responses. Imagine you're trying to load up a car and the car can only hold uh, 800 pounds and you're using that unreliable scale and the scale that may uh, measure something that weighs 200 pounds and give you 200 or 100 or 300, how are you going to be able to accurately uh, load that car with 800 pounds if you're using that broken scale? You can't. And that's the same thing going on in an experiment. So getting back to this idea of error, let me introduce the idea of the observed score. When you take a test, uh, the score you get on that test is going to be your observed score. Let's say that we give you a measure of self-esteem and you get a 9 out of 10 on that. Okay, that's your observed, absorbed, observed score, excuse me. And what that number 9 means is it's made up of your true ability, that is your true value, your true amount of uh, self-esteem plus random error. And so uh, what that means is the more random error in the measurement of your self-esteem, the less of your true ability is seen in your observed score. So if there's a lot of random error in your observed observe score, then uh, that score, that score of 9, is telling you very little about what your self-esteem is. Uh, and again, the less error, the more reliable the test, and the less error, the more the test tells us our true score. That's what reliability really means. We're getting a measure of what our real level of self-esteem is, our real level of IQ is, our real level of servant leadership is. And so that's why error, we want to reduce it, and uh, we want to keep it out of our experiments. People often ask me, well, what, what is random error? What are we talking about? Well, uh, the other video uh, that I ask you to watch sometimes talks about systematic and unsystematic random error. Uh, systematic random error is things in the test itself that aren't working correctly, that can be controlled by the researcher doing a better job. And uh, that's the systematic error. Uh, you know, uh, making the test questions more uh, you know, similar to each other, making them work off the definition more, having a more standardized method of scoring it. All of these are systematic error. Now, then there's truly unsystematic or random error, and that's things that cannot be controlled by the researcher, such as 
whether or not the people taking the test are sick or not, whether or not they had a good breakfast or not, uh, whether or not for some reason or another right at that second they are paying attention or not. These are random errors. And the best that we can do as researchers is work on those systematic random errors. There are still going to be truly random errors, those unsystematic errors, and uh, there's nothing we can do about that. So let's get some data about reliability. And one of the best ways to do that, uh, the easiest to explain, is test retest reliability. And the idea is that we expect on a reliable test that scores should be consistent over time. That is, if I stand on the scale and then hop off the scale and a minute later stand on the scale again, it should give me the same measure because I haven't lost weight or gained weight in a minute. And that's what test retest reliability is. If a questionnaire has good test retest reliability, that each time I take the questionnaire, my score should be similar. Uh, test re te test uh, <coughs> excuse me test retest reliability is typically determined from the relationship between the same individual scores on a questionnaire that they take uh, when they take the questionnaire at different times. The length of time between the administrations is based on the theory behind the construct. For example, extroversion and IQ, these constructs are considered to be very stable. So you could wait a month or two or even a year between administrations and a reliable test would give the same value for IQ. However, other uh, constructs such as mood and individuation are very, very unstable. And so you would have to uh, you know, give a re test retest reliability test within minutes if you wanted to use this method uh, to do a reliability study on mood or individuation. Uh, one source of inform the other source of information about reliability comes from internal consistency. And internal consistency is how similar the scores on different items of the survey are to each other. And there's two ways that we can go about uh, getting that data. One is the split half method and one is using Cronbach's alpha. Now getting internal consistency uh, data from the split half me method is fairly easy. As the name implies we're going to split the test in half. So we're going to say the first 10 questions are half one, the second 10 are half two, or we can say the odd questions are one half and the even questions are one half and then we're going to correlate them to each other. And so we're just looking at the correlation of one set of questions, one half of the test to the other half of the test. And that will give us an internal uh, measure of reliability. And then we can look at Cronbach's alpha. This is a purely statistical method in that we take that idea of the split half methods and we say, well, what if instead of correlating half the test with the other half of the test, we correlate one fourth of the test with another fourth and that fourth with the other fourth and, and then well let's break that down until we correlate one item with another item and then we do that for every item on the test. So item one is correlated with item two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. Item two is correlated with one, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. And we have all these correlations, all these measures of how similar or different people are responding to the questions, and then we average those correlations together. And so that gives us another internal method of assessing reliability, and that's Cronbach's alpha. And please note, Cronbach's alpha is different from the alpha level used when we're talking about type 1 and type 2 errors in inferential statistical tests. Regardless of the method, we can use the same set of rubrics to uh, assess the reliability uh, of, you know, uh, reliability data. 0.71, a reliability of 0.71, is the bare minimum of, uh, you know, uh, reliability. What this means is half the test score is error, and the other half is measuring the trait. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute or so. Uh, one is no error, you're just measuring the trait itself, 
that's pretty much impossible. Uh, 0.8 you know, to 0.9, those are considered moderate reliabilities. Uh, the 90s are considered good. And so uh, these are the rubrics you can use to assess reliability from any of these methods. And a truck's going by, so there it goes. And remember, unreliable tests add error variance to the data, and error variance decreases the st statistical power of statistical tests you're using to test your hypotheses. And so that's why we want to have the best reliability. We want to keep uh, the error variance low. So now let me ex actually describe and explain what I'm talking about where I get these rubrics from. Uh, and we need to talk about the coefficient of determination. And that's where we take the internal consistency, however we measure it, and we square it. And the coefficient of determination gives us the percent of the test score due to true ability. So let's say that we have a uh, you know internal consistency rating, a Crohn's back alpha of 0.75. We square that, and that gives us 0.56. So it says that at an alpha level, uh, Crohn's back alpha level of 0.75. Uh, the true ability that's being measured in the test or the amount of that test score that measures true ability is 56%. That's just better than half. That's not great. Uh, but then let's take a look at the BSRI masculinity scales. I said before when we were doing the uh, multi-trait, multi-method uh, you know, demonstration, its reliability when we correlate masculinity with itself on the BSRI is 0.85. That I said in my rubrics is an okay, a, a moderate uh, you know, reliability. Let's take a look at that. 0.85 squared is 0.72 or 72% of your uh, BSRI, BSRI masculine score is due to your true level of masculinity. And then we can turn that around and say, well, uh, 1 minus 0.72, your level of true uh, score, uh, the, what's left over is 0.28. 28% of the score is due to random error. And so we can say, ah, so that's where we get this error from. That is, the higher the you know, reliability level, the less error we have. We can actually measure it and calculate it. And so when we get up to 0.9, think about this, uh, 0.9 squared is 0.81. So that's 81% of the test score is due to true ability. And 1 minus 0.81 is, let's see, 19. 19% of the score is due to random error. And that's pretty good. Finally, and you may want to do this, uh, especially thinking about this, uh, what I'm talking about with validity and reliability in terms of psychological tests can apply perfectly well to academic tests, that is exams. So yes, your exams, they have a reliability level, and every exam you take has one. And they also have different levels of different types of validity. So when you look at these, let me get my laser pointer. Where is it? There we go. Where's my cursor? There's my laser pointer. So when you look at these, what type of reliability would you like for your midterm exam? Well, fortunately, I can tell you that I, because this is what I teach, I've calculated the reliability of exams before, and my multiple choice exams have reliabilities in the upper 90s. And so like one, the last one I, I calculated has like a, a 0.97 reliability. And so you can square that and figure out uh, the amount of true ability that is true knowledge that you have that's showing up in that test score, and then how much random error is showing up in your test score, which is not that much. Because you don't want to have random error showing up in your test scores. Because think about this. Let's say that uh, you get a C plus, a 78 on a test. That's your observed score. Well, what that could mean is two things. If that is a very reliable test, that means that you're a C plus student or that you have C plus knowledge of the test material and the test accurately with a very little error measured your 
knowledge of the test of the test material. But what happens if the reliability is very low, uh, 0.71? Then that means if you get a 78 on the exam, uh, that's your observed score, but your true knowledge of the material could be much higher or much lower. You could be an A student and an unreliable test is telling you you're a C plus student. Or you could be a uh, F student and the test could be incorrectly telling you that you're a C plus student. That's what low reliability means and we really don't want that.